so hospitality consulting what's that looking like right now she, Pro uh, profitable for the first time in about no, no shit. three years yeah i uh, i don't think you've met anybody that can work for free the way i do mm. i spent uh i get it a long time i mean i it literally i was getting because like the whole shtick is like your first hour is free so i'll talk to anybody mm -hmm. for an hour and with the f knowledge that I can impart in an hour, I can help save you or make you money. I, I guarantee it for 99% of the time. So that was my thing. I'll give you an hour for free because so many people gave me more than an hour. Sure. Like, I mean, my CV reads impressively, but like, unless I was the only guy in the room, I was never the smartest guy in the room. And the, and the reason why I had so much uh, behind me and so many accolades and won awards and, and just was on so many impressive projects was because everybody I worked with was like, and it's not imposter syndrome. Like I deserve to be there, I think, but, uh, everyone there was just more talented and smarter and more committed and more schooled. I mean like Cornell and worked at Starwood, worked at Peninsula, worked for Ritz Carlton in different countries. And it's like, uh, you know, I ran a place in Westchester. <laughs> yeah, but I think there's there's a lot to be said about absorbing what you're around. You know what I mean? As far as like what you're saying, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but when you're in a lot of rooms with a lot of smart people, it starts to sink in a lot. Sure, but you have to be working with people that are willing to teach you and mentor you. Mm. I mean, I've I, I had a gig in D.C. for a year where um, I was being ridden by this owner and I knew I was better, but she didn't want me there. Um, and, uh, the principal partners with more interest were a very prominent family in DC and they wanted me there, but it was almost like she was trying to drive me away. And whenever I learned something from it, because no matter how good you are at what you do and how confident, if somebody's always on top of you, riding you, you're just going to fuck up. You're yep. going to make mistakes yeah. that you would not normally make. And you know, you need to have that confidence and you need to have that support. And it's a network. Yeah. You know, you can't go at it alone against the grain in this business. Cause I mean, you have to work. It's, it sounds cliche, but you really do have to be a team. Yeah. No doubt. So where'd you cut your, your uh, your chops, so to speak. <laughs> I, my family went to a, an Italian restaurant near where I grew up at least once a week. And, um, I mean, so much so that like if something came up, they'd leave my sister and I at the table, like fully trusting. It was like a second home. <laughs> so when I turned, I think it was 13, I wanted to work there. And they gave me a job being a busboy. And um, it was called Ristorante Albertos on City Avenue and Haverford Avenue, right wow. across from the JCC. Uh, like near, kind of like in between St. Joe's campus and Wynwood. Okay. And uh, if I, if I, knew then what I knew now, I had burned my apron in the dumpster like, <laughs> that weekend because I begged to be the dishwasher. I, I mean, I saw this guy coming in, everybody was complaining about him, he was drunk, he was a mess. And uh, I just begged and the owner said to me, why do you wanna, look, your mommy, she killed me. You're not the, be the dishwasher. Uh, Alberto Guadagnini was the guy's name. Oh my <laughs> lord. So if you know him, he's also, he's got a couple places in Westchester. He's a partner in Tekka in Newtown Square. Okay, yeah. um, with Chris Scarduzio. Anyway, um, he wouldn't let me do it. And finally, one night, the guy that was in the dishwasher, I mean, like, I didn't know what booze smelled like, but I knew that night. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, tell me why you want to be the dishwasher right now. And, and so I said, honestly, I said, these guys drink beer every night they eat whatever they want for dinner they curse all night long they bring <laughs> they, they would bring in like shopping bags of like dirty movies like on vhs <laughs> I mean, like they trade dirty movies yeah. like it's a party back here i want to work out with these guys he looked me in the eye and he said you promised me you don't tell your mommy that this was my idea and that you wanted this i said yeah he said you promise i said i promise he walked right over i'll never forget the sound of the door he grabbed this guy by the belt threw a plastic apron and a cloth apron, walked them right down the line and literally 
threw him out the back door. You could smack, smack, awesome. smack, 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 smack the screen door. <laughs> and I'll never forget I did it. And just after that, you know, like somebody was late showing up. Hey, help me with the sandwiches. Yeah. Help me on garmanger. Sure. Help me on salads. Help me on the grill. And little by little, I got to, you know, do a little bit. But I OCD. I still wanted to know what was going on in the front. No doubt. So, and that pretty much sums up my whole career. It was just a lot of series of working in the back, working in the front, mm-hmm. working in management until, you know, you're just opening restaurants and, and sticking and moving everywhere. God, we have a very similar background when it comes to that. I mean, outside of the fact that, you know, the bar business, I grew up above my, my family bar. Um, but I, I, I can remember what that excitement was, the first job you had. You remember, like, and it was like, God, this is like organized chaos like the place i worked at the head chef was a um vietnam vet he would have flashbacks and he was fucking you know high on acid all the time he would throw sizzle plates of you know fucking crap oh. imperial at people oh, yeah. like it was so exciting you know and you're it, it, you're just bringing me back to that you go i mean you, i mean that was old school right yeah. literally when mm-hmm. you get hot pants thrown at you sure. and today it's a lawsuit back then it was like Fuck you! Uh-huh. You walk out and you're like, I had pants thrown at me today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look at all, look at all the cash I have in my pocket. Like, you pussy. I just bought yeah. a 16 inch TV, <laughs> yeah. man, from Circuit City. From Circuit City. I can get like three Game Boys with this with this VHS. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, when you know your only source of income is you know working for your parents, um, or shoveling sidewalks yeah. and buying baseball cards, you know suddenly. It, it's a cash rich business yep. where there's camaraderie and there's energy and there's music. And, yeah. you know, I talk about it all the time. You know, everyone thinks, you know, where are you going to get help anymore? But a lot of people have started doing their own thing. A lot of people have gone to jobs with benefits. Mm-hmm. But I personally believe that there's something. I'm a big like Maslow's hierarchy of needs sure. guy. Yep. And, um, I think that the restaurant industry offers something that's so unique that if you are really an emotionally codependent giver and share and people person, and you're not only driven to invest in the humanity of it, but you thrive in it. Mm -hmm. And no matter how great the benefits are at Walmart or Best Buy or wherever you're working from home, it's, there's no music, there's no friends, there's no gossip, there's no dancing around, there's no, busting balls and having fun doing it and not being insulted. There's no, you know, practical jokes. I mean, it's such a high energy, physically touch driven tactile tactile place. Mm. Absolutely. And just, you don't have that interaction. I mean, I am so much, the hospitality industry is, hospitality is so ingrained in me just from my upbringing that that's why I ended up in the business. It's not like because I was in the business so long, it became a part of me. Mm-hmm. That's where I was and that's where I belong still. But so much so that when I go to the supermarket, like I embarrass my wife or my daughter, whoever's with me. And they're like, why are you talking to the cashier? I'm like, because nobody probably talked to them all day long. And look, we're laughing. They're smiling. They're having a good time. It's so monotonous. Look at what they're doing. They're right. scanning them, <clears throat> putting stuff in bags. Like talk to them, be they're nice. Really yeah. yeah. <laughs> With Laverne and Shirley. Yeah. Yep. Watching the belt. Uh, because I love Lucy. I was thinking of that. Same, same thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. Beers versus candy. True. True. So um, let's talk a little bit about your um, places that you worked and, and where you really started to get into management and whatnot. Um, oh, my God. What, what was your first managerial job? I have no idea. Uh, so managing that dish. Bowl? I was a part-time manager at Orange Julius in the Springfield no Mall. Shit. <laughs> that was <laughs> probably the first time I had keys to anything. Wow. And uh, and then sandwich. Big shit too, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, well, I I, uh, I got to talk to the girl who was in charge of pizzas a lot. And she was pretty cute. And uh, there were, but It's funny because there's there's the subculture of it is so attractive. But yet, you know, it's not that cool mm-hmm. yeah. when your friends walk in and you're like, cause it's like a little bit of embarrassment. And then as soon as they leave, there's pride and like, yeah. <laughs> you love it. It's like riding a moped, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like this is so much fun. Your friends yeah. pull up in a car and you're like, what's going on guys? You feel the wind <laughs> oh, you're going to a birthday party or an <laughs> anniversary? Like, no, I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> I remember my first, um, New Year's Eve too, um, working in like, 
feeling the loss of not being with my friends and like how long did that last be honest fucking 10 minutes you know what i mean yeah i i mean when you work 20 30 new year's eves in a row yeah yeah it gets to be like, what am I missing? Am I missing getting in a fight with somebody mm-hmm. or breaking up and then getting back together in the in twenty minute interval? Right to that. Or you're, you know, you just you're, you're hanging out. With you're them. out of control. You're, you're, your other friends, your work friends. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's what. The, the downside is you're counting a tremendous amount of cash. Like you feel like you should be naked at a table full of cocaine <laughs> in New Jack City. I mean, it's like it gets ridiculous the Need cash no flow, but yeah. but that's changed a lot. It's not as cash heavy these days. Thank God. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so, uh, I, my first GM job was, uh, the restaurant and bar, which became the first Kildare's in Westchester. Okay. Um, those guys bought, bought us and they offered to send me to Ireland to learn the cuisine of Ireland. (laughs) And I I politely declined. (laughs) I didn't. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't do that. Uh. But it was uh, it was flattering to be offered, you know. It's uh, I felt like they respected me enough to ask and put the offer out there. But did you I, work I for Dave? No. Okay. No. Got it. And what'd you head after that? I have to look at my CV. Yeah. There's so many places. I mean, I worked in Maniunk and Westchester, and then Center City, and then um, where was Peninsula, uh, Warrington, Pennsylvania. And that was just, you know, everybody's got that one horror story. That was my one horror story. Yeah. What was Peninsula? I remember hearing about that. Peninsula Grill. Uh, right. It was a real estate or some type of uh, lawyer who invested a lot of money and mm-hmm. wanted to bring in a team. Had a great, beautiful property. Guy knew food. Yeah. I mean, knew what he liked. Just one of those guys that knows exactly what he likes and wants to see it happen. Right, right, right. And doesn't matter what it costs. But, it, you know, when when you are used to balancing line items, you can't yeah, sure. help but be like, that's a $23 bread basket on every table. Right, like, right, right. Come on. Like, we're giving an entree away to everyone who sits down. That's not sustainable. And uh, and there was a consulting group, Ed Doherty was in there Doherty. he was he worked at the capitol grill he's one he at the time it was fireworks is he at del frisco's now i don't know no i don't think so he's he's retired but he also is okay. connected he does some consulting i think he works with um i can't think of the name of the coffee guy not la Colombe. uh the guy who i can't think not in the coffee world josh Yes, you are. You just don't know it. Everybody's in the coffee world. <laughs> anyway, um, there was a consulting there. And one of the consultants was the guy from the Kildare's deal. Okay. And uh, there was just so much backstabbing and conniving. And it's like, what, what's going on? And uh, that turned into enough people whispering in my ear by spending at that time, I don't know, a decade in the business, maybe 15 years, that you have enough people saying like, run <laughs> and I so i did and I, I went to i went to dc and uh the car family owned a bunch of stuff uh, out by the treasury and the capital um so i worked at the occidental i ran that as uh one a uh, management team there's like three of us running that for all that was really fun and um from there i got an offer to oversee a couple locations for uh, Grill Concepts out of Newport Beach. They opened yes. a place called uh, Daily Grill okay. and the Georgetown Inn. And, you know, what a great place to be a young single guy with cash in your pocket. Yeah. Oh, my God. So I, I lived in Georgetown right down the block from Kerry Hines' family. Oh, so, you yeah. know, I've had to show documentation to get down my street. Right. Which is cool because you're watching stuff on television where you're like, you <laughs> see stuff and you're like, that's happening outside. Um, love D.C., what a great place. And it's just everybody has a cooler job than you do. And you hear nine different languages at the East Coast of uh, Hollywood, right? Yeah. But yeah. after a while, it starts to feel like the main line, right? It's yeah. like, it's like, wait a minute, this is very homogenous and mm-hmm. nobody's really from there. I think I was there four years. I met two people that were actually from, from there, DC yeah. and living yeah. there. Um, but that was a great place. And then from there, um, was in line one day at a Chipotle and doing things that smart people don't do when they're not working. And just 
you know, jamming off to the music. Like I'm a big jam bands guy. And so they were playing just music I really liked. And uh, my buddy who's behind me says, you should work the here, man. You could, you could run this place. Imagine how much fun this would be. And some guy sitting down, his name was Dan Lowe, was sitting down in the middle from corporate. And he said, oh, are you, you looking for a job? And I said, no, why? And, <laughs> how much? Why, why are you asking? <laughs> right. It was like, how much? Well, like, do you have, have you, do you have any restaurant experience? Yeah. And my buddy's like, this guy, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like I had an agent. And uh, so he said, yeah, go, go get your burrito and then sit down with me when you're done. I want to talk to you. Just, you know, find out a little bit about you. So, you know, big ego at the time. I'm like, yeah, this guy wants to, maybe we could do something with our restaurants. I don't know, an event. And uh, I sat down with him. And by the time I walked out of there, I was like, I think I want to work for this company. This is crazy because I had been, I had started like a small catering thing, like at shows and festivals selling you know, all organic burritos because I was like a pseudo hippie. And hash brownies. <laughs> yeah. like, back in my main and tail days with dreadlocks down to here. Uh, and my overalls and my Boston's, <laughs> my my Boston Birkenstocks days. Yeah. And, um, and I'm like, these, I mean, the food, it's changed a lot. Don't get me wrong. I still think it's a great company and it's got a good product, but the product and the people used to be amazing. Yeah. Uh, like honestly the when i look back on all the places i worked and the people i worked with chipotle and star restaurants are the two places i feel like really molded me and and caused me to see the world and restaurants and the world as a big restaurant okay and hospitality really i, I know it sounds silly it's a no, qsr no. corporate qsr but yeah. um maybe it wasn't the Chipotle that taught me that I was just fortunate to meet again a lot of really smart passionate committed people working at a Chipotle like we would go to food festivals and events and competitions and people would be like I thought you were working for Chipotle what are you doing here I'm like taste this canapé man and <laughs> the food was off the charts like crazy it was cool. really insane and I don't think it is the same way anymore but the culture and the autonomy that we were given really was unlike anything I've ever had. I mean, to, to develop a market, a neighborhood, a region in any way you wanted was, I mean, and I was like DC, Virginia, Maryland, college park to, mm. to Adams Morgan, like Georgetown area. And that was my home store. And the ability to go out and just comp things and make people happy. They just give you a budget and say, go run with it. Would I, I mean, and if you said, I want an extra two grand in comps this month because I want to do some. Okay. No oh, shit. I mean, yeah. Not only that, but they, like, I would say, like, we're using Bell and Evans chicken. Like, I want to learn more about it. They sent me to the Bell and Evans chicken ranch where you're walking around chicks that are like puppies. It's like a puppy farm. They're like yeah. just running around and, and you see, I mean, you could eat off the floors in the place. It's, it's absolutely, if you've ever been in a butcher shop or a poultry yeah. factory, like, to, it feels like you're in a hospital. It doesn't yeah, feel like you're. Yep. It doesn't feel like you're in <clears throat> in a butchery at all. And my mind. the thing yeah, they, so, they don't want in Del Marva. What's that chicken? Yeah, yeah. There's a smell to it. It's yeah. like right, in but, factory, in factory. Bar. Yeah, but go to a Nyman Ranch. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Or, yeah. or about, it's not there. Yeah, it's, it's like crazy. this is clear. It's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are they all named? Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's so humane and it's so clean, and that made such an impact on me that they asked me to speak at one of the Northeast conferences and you know, with two and a half minutes notice because they were just like, this guy's a dork. Like he geeks out on all this stuff. He'll talk, just give him a microphone. He'll tell you, we'll probably have to tell him they're like, St stop. Yeah. Right. And, uh, just the commitment to sustainability, the commitment to community. Right. Like we wanted to sponsor concerts, do it. There was never any hesitation. Um, take care of people. Surprise and delight. You know, we're family. Surprise and delight people. I mean, people drop it like they drop the word love. You know, like on how many restaurants and bars do you know where they're like, come on, we're a family here. And it's like, all I think about yeah. is 
my dry cleaner hangers. It's like, we love our customers. Sure. It's like, okay, that's great. You could say it. Yeah, yeah we're a family here. But like, but I'm you're, not feeling it. You're a fucking asshole to me. Yeah, you're, right. you're, you know, yeah. you're so, fucking her. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was the real deal. They walked the walk. They talked the talk. And what I realized when I found that at Chipotle, and it was the same thing at Star Restaurants, I realized it's not the product, it's the people, mm. it's the team, it's the hospitality. And, and that's why, you know, I think there's a very distinct difference between being in the food and beverage industry and being in the hospitality industry. Yeah. And some people say, oh, hotels. I'm like, no, people. Yes, it is. It's because it's about people. It's about making people not only feel recognized and not only feel important, but feel so safe and so connected that they feel like this is my place. Yeah, yeah. some Dale Carnegie shit. all you man. have to do. Yep. Yeah. Ah, I'm so glad you said that. Because I've been on a couple other podcasts where people are like, totally dark Dale Carnegie. And I'm like, that is the cliff notes for caring. Yeah, yeah. And it teaches people <laughs> how to say and do all the right things as if they care. But it's like, it's, it's about being if it's genuine. not genuine, yep. it, right. you're cheating. And yeah. I could smell it on you like cigarettes. And it's like, sure. I don't smoke. And it's like, you don't give a fuck. I could tell. There's, there's also like, and I can see it in you. And it's probably why you've been so successful. Like, there's a lot to be said about curiosity and passion, you know, being mixed together. You know what I mean? Oh my God. And, and like you're saying, the autonomy of, that you had with Chipotle, um, th with them breeding that, it, it, it does make, you know, something where it could be a fucking miserable existence to like, oh my God, this is amazing. I smell like burritos. Yeah. I go home. But when you go home, look, everybody wants to go home no matter how much you beat up. Like, I mm -hmm. fucking killed it today. Mm -hmm. Like I turned that shit around. Look at these numbers. I, I, I solved this drama. You know, they're happy now. They like me now. You yeah. know, the customers are saved. Everybody's happy. But in Chipotle, especially, uh, it's a trickle down effect. And I think they're so fucking smart that they knew it. They gave me so much autonomy that when somebody gives you a gift like that and you appreciate it, what do you do? Give oh, it away. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So I would give it away to, I developed training programs that they still have today, like training the trainer, giving the knife, like having all the line cooks. I brought in, you know, Santa safe knives, nothing big, you know, but, sure. but this is your, it was like culinary yep. school. Take it's it like, home. this yep. is your knife. This is your sheath. I want you to take care of it. We're going to, we're bringing in an expert rep but right. an expert to teach you safety skills knife setting skills and like you could put your name on it you could wrap it in it whatever you want to do it's yours now and that sense of ownership and pride when you when you get that it's they felt in a different space and level the same way i felt like somebody respected me enough to say this is yours do what you want with it you're responsible for it and you better be safe and you know a big part of it is you know I want you to act like you own the place. Mm -hmm. So like my joke was, I did and I sold it for eight million and I'm not coming to work tomorrow. But <laughs> no, you really, when somebody believes in you and trusts you, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know if you've read the book by a guy from Netflix, but there's a lot in don't make rules that are gonna limit your best people to keep your lowest end people in line, mm. get rid of those people, have no rules and just have a culture and just yeah. say, it's, you know, it's like parenting. It's like, you don't say, stop playing with that knife. You say, here, play with this. It's distraction and guidance. You're not catching people doing things wrong. You're helping people doing things right. Yeah. You're not saying, you know, oh, you need, you needed to buy something when you, and you spent 10 times what you could have gotten it for somewhere else. Like, you have to teach fiscal responsibility. You know, people don't, you don't just instinctively know it. Right. And that happens by not getting mad at somebody for making a mistake yeah. and giving them the ability not only to take ownership and, and giving them possession of their, of their day and their future and their tools, but letting them make mistakes and not getting mad. It's like, yes. oh, I can make a mistake and it'll be okay. And I always tell anybody, even people that aren't my employees, that are somebody else's employees that hire me, it's like, if you do the wrong thing, I'm never gonna get mad. As long as it's, you're doing the wrong thing trying to make a customer happy. Mm -hmm. You try to keep the guest happy, I don't have a problem. It might not be the right thing to do, and we'll talk about what you should have done instead and why, right. 
But you're not going to get in trouble for making a mistake. You're inspiring the shit out of me. Did, did you ever listen to a podcast called Manager of Tools? Manager tools. and Tools? No, Manager Tools. Oh. No. It was one of the original podcasts that came out, especially... I was going to say, that yeah. would be me. I'm a manager and a tool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of things you're hitting on that they used to talk about. I used to listen to it when I would drive long ways to work and back. Um, I was just bringing that up. I don't know. Uh, but like, you're you're hitting on so many things that like really resonate with me. You're really like... Um, God, there's so much. Like, like, like you're saying, like... It, you never get mad at somebody, especially like when they're going to make, they're trying to make the customer um, feel good, right? And it's mm-hmm. always, you can't fail that way, like no matter what you do. And 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 there's so many people that that will take them down for doing something wrong that way. But if you're trying to make the customer feel happy, they're never going to leave unhappy. You know, it's it's so important. And I'm well, right, you and, and you know. Th- I've taken a lot of like one liners away from guys who have mentored me over the years. And, and one of the things that uh, a buddy of mine always says is I can forgive an overcooked steak or an undercooked piece of fish. What I can't forgive is rude and inattentive service. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like remember my name, appreciate my dollar that I worked hard for to give you remember what I drink and be nice to me. No chef wants to hear this, but the food is 30% of it. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. You know, everybody talks about food, but at the end of the day, it's what it's something that I, and I wrote a, on our article on this a small article that it's called the, uh, the acupunctural, acupunctural effect of hospitality, where it's like, it's not one single needle, right? The food is just a needle. There's like 20 needles in you. And you're like, I love this place. And most people that aren't in the business can't really articulate what they love about yep. it. They're just like, I don't know. I just, this is my place. I love it. Amen. I can tell you when I sit down and are first greeted by a waiter, whether that person hates their job, you know what I mean? Whether they literally just don't want to be here today. Yeah. It's not just today, you know, cause people can put a face on like yeah. people that breathe hospitality. will put that face on for the initial time. And then maybe they'll open up a little bit and be like, yeah, one of those days or whatever, you know, but what there mean? are you people, right. There are those guys who, and girls who are just, full of hospitality but not keen on where they're working mm-hmm. yeah, right yeah, sure, and you could sure. smell that too right, right right yeah for sure and those are the times where it's like what a great experience if you ever are looking for extra shifts and they're not giving you enough call me right which you know you say what you want about poaching but if my attitude is if you're taking care of your people and they're happy I mean, it's kind of like if your wife leaves you, like are you going to get mad at the guy yeah. who, who your wife left you for or exactly. your wife for not being yeah. loyal or Agreed. yourself for not being a good uh, I, partner? I right. just exactly. don't do it to friends. That's yeah. all. That's yeah. all. No, I mean, yeah. it's it's crazy. You know, I hear half of what I do on the consulting side is contract reviews and, and helping yeah. people draft agreements. And the other half is training and hiring and kind of vetting and screening people and the number one pushback is it's the oldest line in the book. It's like, what if I spend all this money and time training people and they leave? And the answer is like, what if you don't and they stay? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, this isn't an option. Right, right, exactly. Like, if you want to do this right, like, you, we, right. you need to be all in. So on that topic, I have a friend that's dealing with an issue right now. So he's... He's a hands-on guy, but very much has management run a single Irish publication, right? And he's like, how do I get your Jess? How do I get your manager? Where do I find this person? And I'm like, you know, and he lives in an area that's been pretty built up in the past 10 years. And he's been there like, you know, before that. And I'm like, well, have you gone to the, you know, Longhorn Steakhouse or have you gone to the Twin Peaks or whatever the new exciting Miller's Out House, something like that? And, and talk to people there and, you know, just, just understand, A, what their program is training-wise and all that, but also, like, literally talk to them. Are they happy where they work? Do they might maybe want to come work for a smaller, more cultural, family kind of feeling place? And uh, he's like, well, yeah, I ain't going to go poach anybody. You probably know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm not going to go poach anybody. Oh, it gets, it's and, poli- and I'm like, there's well, a political divide between yeah, the opinions yeah, there is. of this. Because so, I'm like, I wouldn't even hire a bartender who works somewhere else. I'll tell them, you got to talk to that person or I got to talk to that person before you even interview. Because then you're like, you know, you're trying it out. 
You know what I mean? Like, so I, I feel you, but I also, you know, just went through Corona and we can't get anybody to work at least, at least once a week. Our kitchen manager has a problem with filling a kitchen chip. Look, at least once let, a week. let me stop you right yeah. there. Because in my opinion, this is not an integrity issue. Okay. And I'll be the first one to say, I go to bed every night with my integrity intact. Good, good. Okay. And, but that's and not to sound woke or anything. There's, <laughs> I recognize my privilege. I've got a roof over my head. I've got shoes without holes. I've got stocked fridge and the stocked bar at home. I don't have to be said for it, you know, socks. when I, it, you know, seriously, take it all away and tell me why daughter's sick and needs medicine and I don't have a job. My integrity will not be there. I guarantee it. Yeah, right. I will not have integrity and I will do whatever I need to do to get by. Sure. And I think a lot of people are like that in this country. And, but the question of poaching, I don't think it's an integrity issue. I think it's a position and a perspective. Right. And some people view it like, how could you date her when we went out for so long? You don't right. do that. We're right, boys, right, right, like right. bros, bros before hoes and all that right, shit. Right. And that translates into restaurants and bars. But my attitude always, and it goes back to the training, you know, if you're truly invested in your people and it's not a bullshit tagline, we're a family and all that, yeah, horse, yeah, yeah. if you really care about them and you want to train them and make them better people and understand that this is probably not the only stop in their life, the same way it's not the only thing in your life. You want the best for them. You want, if there's a better opportunity, like my whole thing is like, if you want to go and there's, and you're going to learn more or make more or get closer to your goal, I want that for you. I want that for you. And not to bring it back to training again, but I'm all about training. So, you know, the whole thing is people get scared. What if I spend all this time and money and you come in here and you train all these people and then they leave. Right. Well, guess what happens when they leave a lot a lot of times they're coming back because mm -hmm. not a lot of people are investing in the training. And when somebody comes to me, somebody who's looking at a management job or something like, what's their training program like? Well, I'm gonna be the GM. Like, I don't care <laughs> if you're gonna be the executive chef or GM or a hostess, what's the training program like? If, if they're putting you as a GM or an executive chef in a three week training program and you're coming in as a line cook and staging first and then line mm -hmm. cook and garm, whatever you're doing, like that says that they want to make sure you're set up for success. They want you to know the business every, every show and right. And, and cross, that means they're going to cross train you and they're investing that time and money. Mm -hmm. It's not hoops and bullshit. Like they care about you. And then when you learn systems of operation and organization and you're tied to the financials, you know what happens when you leave and you go, you're like, these fucking people don't know what the hell's going on. How do they not have a system for this? Like, why don't these guys know how much that steak costs yeah, sure. on the front end? Right. Like, yeah, I lost eight bucks, but it's 60 bucks. Like, how yeah. do they not know? And suddenly they miss that structure. We're all kids inside, you know, and being a father has changed a lot about how I view this industry. Sure. And, but people like clear expectations, follow through, challenge them to show you care and give them structure. Because guess what? When they leave and somebody's not giving them that much, they'll come back because they we all crave it. We love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially in an industry like this. And COVID, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. We could talk about that. But nah. my attitude <laughs> is, you know, whether it's high tide or low tide, take care of your people. If they have an opportunity to do something better for themselves, you should be all over it. Yeah. And if somebody wants to leave like you and come to work for me or one of my clients, then that's not me stealing them. That's you not keeping them. Mm, right. That's all. And and if you are doing your job and you are making them happy, they'll come back to you. It's it's love, man. If yeah. it's really love, then you set it free. Yeah. No, I dig it. I dig it. And I think, you know, so that, that gets into... Um, yeah. I mean, if you get to... My whole point to my buddy was go to these places and hang out. And spend time and get to know them. Yeah. Right. And because, you know, yeah, sure, you can go there and be like, hey, I own this bar down the road. You interested in a, a job? You could you could just be that blunt. And depending on desperation and how things are, you could be there. But I think if you're going and spending a little time, just getting to know who people are, 
you know, letting the doors open, I guess, is, is kind of my approach. Well, but, and pre-COVID, yeah. that was great. And you could yeah. do that all day long, especially with somebody that's in like a working. Michelin star rated, sure, sure. the hottest place in town, because we all kind of like adversity, right? Yeah. Like, sure. I mean, you're a glutton for punishment if you're in this for more than a summer at the beach, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So some of the best people to poach if you're looking to poach, are the people that are taking the field every day with the New York Yankees. They know they're not going to lose right, because right. if they fuck up, they have a bad day. There are nine people standing next to them yep. on either side that are going to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks and you're winning constantly. Do that for five years and suddenly you're like, you, you, if you're a chef, you want to challenge. If you're right. a GM, you're like, I want to have a hand in building something from scratch or making it better, taking something to the next level. Right. Because no matter how long and what position you're working, if you've got this disease, there's right. more fun in building and bettering <laughs> than in maintaining, right? And this disease. It is, it's true, yeah. right? I mean, whether it's real estate or it's yeah. restaurants, like the building part and it's the a, bettering part and renovating most, yeah. part is the most fun part. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Living proof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a great point, man. No, so I guess getting to that, you know, it, it's talking about, um, you know, the labor shortage. It's a real problem. It's a real problem across. My most fearful part about the labor shortage in hospitality is that we're losing people not to other hospitality businesses, but to other businesses. Yes. Uh, on the low end, Amazon. On the high end, uh, you know, maybe a, a boutique sales uh, job selling shirts at Boyd's yeah. to my boy over here. You know, it, it, it because they can. They do it already every day they sell people and they talk to people the good ones the yeah. good ones you know right. and the opportunity to to have more you know a nine to five and, and all that and and so so that you know not to jump all over the map but, but but because of that there are so many in general numbers of people left that want to work and then you have on top of that people that are good because what i said in the consulting business so i had, I had a consulting business in cybersecurity for for uh over a decade the hardest people to get rid of are the ones that are mediocre. They're ones that can just, they just watch, yeah, they watch the belt. Like I say in Laverne and Shirley, like they watch the belt. And they do just <laughs> enough. They do just enough to make sure that they're, you know, there's no good reason to get rid of them. There's just, and there never will be. Because that, that's, I call them pikers. <laughs> pikers? Yeah. Not pikies. Gypsies. What, where they watch the belt, piker. Anyway, but um, it, it's, it, and so now we have this available the, the bigger problem is we have this, we have the better, there's a lot less better people, you know? And it's, yeah, it might not be time to jump out and start your your own thing. I don't, you know what? I don't know. That's my concern. Like I, 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 at I all levels, just bartending, a kitchen. I think there's a jobs gap. I, I don't, I'm not That's looking huge. at, yeah. I'm not looking at it as like, this is a food and beverage thing. I think it's more obvious a food and beverage because people frequent those more. You know what I mean? Like you're not noticing like that there's a, a labor shortage in Amazon because you don't fucking know. You're not walking in Amazon. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. I do hospitality. Well, I understand that, but I, I just think that it, I think it's more in in the public eye because that's where the public goes for their relaxation and downtime, right? Yeah. Um, they're they're not going to you know, you know, Joe Blow fucking law office and, and realizing that their two paralegals didn't show up today. Nobody knows or cares about that, but they do because they're not getting their 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 donut and Einstein bagels, you know, or yeah. whatever. Um, but I, I don't I don't think that there there's we're losing people to the, the food and beverage industry per se. Um, I just think that there's a lack of quality or not. Yeah, good point. I, <laughs> no, no, it is. No. It is. I hear you. It's it's not that it's this specific pool that's short right. on water. It's mm -hmm. there's a water shortage. Yeah, and our pool's a little right. clearer than others. Yeah. Um, I, but I also believe where somebody said this to me a couple of years ago, like they're talking about how this generation, you know, that's coming up now, you know, they're on their phones all the time that, you know, they don't know human interaction as well. I think this person pointed out to me and ever since then I've, I've noticed that it's the opposite of that. They crave human interaction with people and there are more rock stars in there because they're used to their, their counterparts at school or whatever that are, consumed with media that's in front of them that there, there are so many more people out there that are craving human interaction on a daily basis that we're starting to get more people they're, they're just a little different in their in their mentality and, and and how they look at the world like it's a it's a feelings-based culture that generation where we're not used to that you know we're all about grit and hard work and 
you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you yeah. know, a line like that type of shit. But um, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of truth and insight in what you're saying. And I think a lot of people don't see it that way. But the fact that they are looking down instead of out means that there's a, a greater importance in making a really cool space just to be. And, and that goes on the design tip. Like people have always wanted to be in comfortable, beautiful places, right? But they've also wanted to be around comfortable, beautiful people. You know, there's a reason why you see certain looking people at certain places and you could say it's wrong or right or whatever, but part of that wanting something different and a different kind of interaction just plays right into, yeah, so you need to hire different kinds of people and give them the opportunity to interact with those people. The problem isn't that there's a shortage of great people who are great and know what to do and are really good from this other place and poach. The problem is, in my opinion, is that too many people are saying, I can't find any good mm -hmm. people. Where am I mm -hmm. supposed to find a great chef? Where am I supposed to find a great manager? Yeah. My, my response always is you hire good people and you teach them and train them how to be a good chef or a good bartender, yeah. or a good manager. Yeah. Nobody wants to train. It's almost like yeah, we've adopted this point. American mentality of we don't build shit. We just take it and yeah. resell it and repackage it or break it down. It's like, like you need to make something. You mm -hmm. need to build somebody up and I can't make you a good person. I can't make you care. I can't make you emotionally codependent or, or care or passionate about something. You know, that happens with your upbringing, but I could fucking teach a monkey how to, how to run a bar or a kitchen or a restaurant. If you give me enough, them. it's yeah, <laughs> it's not, it's not, if it's a, if it's somebody who's nah, into it and curious, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And if they're Agreed. having fun, yes, there's a shortage of, there's a water shortage, right? There's a shortage of people, but if you are a sexy, fun, exciting, warm, good place to be, then what people are out there will come Yeah, because You'll have somebody saying, I, I was in IT and now I'm the bar manager and I learned so much this year, somebody gave me a chance. It's the same way in yeah, technology. True. So I was looking for my tech business, I was looking for two software engineers for years. And I, instead of finding them, I was paying like these offshore people and you know they outsource stuff and you and you're paying like ridiculous rates and the developers getting a fraction of it whatever and i couldn't find anybody but once i started advertising for part time you know and i just started talking to people to see like is this guy just a nerd about coding the way i'm a nerd about hospitality like are they just so passionate about it because something about technology and hospitality that is very similar is if you care and you love people and food, you're gonna be willing to learn it. Mm -hmm. And if you have any experience in computers or gaming or anything, like you're, in my opinion, you're, I kind of call them digital linguists. Like in other words, they might know certain computer languages, but not that one. And people will give them tests and make them jump through these hoops and prove that they can code or fix this. And it's like, look, or you could sit across from somebody and say, okay, you know these languages, but you know, that. that's like saying to me, all I hear is, so you speak Spanish, French, German, and Italian, but you don't speak Portuguese? Sorry, we need somebody that speaks Portuguese. Mm. Like if somebody is in the languages and learn, like they yeah. can learn another language yeah, right. and they will, and they will be so grateful that sure, you gave sense. them an opportunity to learn something that they're into, that they want to build, even if it's just to pad their resume and then go on to work at Hard Rock Cafe or, right. or Star Restaurants or, or Marriott or Ritz Carlton somewhere like give them the chance. You will not only have their heart and their hours, you'll have them telling their friends how incredible it is that you are such a great place to work and you're such a good guy or you're such this amazing woman that you've taken them under your wing and taught them and mentored them. Yeah. That's where you get your great people. Yeah, you like don't hire buyer. great employees. Right. You, you, you make you build them, you yeah. train, you build yeah. them. That's what we did in the cybersecurity world. There were yeah. no cybersecurity people, especially people who built security information man man management products for event correlation. Nobody did that. So we and just then hired and, and, We got good, like, you know, good all around 
you know, information systems people out of college, grad school, ideally, with some focus and some technology. And uh, we interviewed them. We thought they uh, they'd fit in the office. We hired. Them. That's so we have we you know trained them in in hospitality and technology. I have the no douchebag rule. Yeah, that's it. If you're not a douchebag, and you're into this, then we could probably yeah. work together and have fun. Yeah. Were you the person who told me that they you you do or you uh, you know somebody who hires people and how quick they walk across the room to shake your hand? I that, that that's a crude summary, but that yeah, that's one of the things. I do a five second. If yeah, Val, I do absolutely. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I look at your posture, how well you're groomed. Mm -hmm. If you're making eye contact, if you smile, I could tell in five seconds. You know, their availability and all that matters. Yeah, sure. But if you're sitting down with me, I'm not going to waste your time or mine. Like, if you can't approach me in a way that makes me interested and curious and happy, you're you're arriving. Yeah. Then why would I want you walking up to a guest? Sure. sure. Interesting. Or greeting yeah. somebody from behind the bar. Yeah, right. you know. what's up with the mustard uh, phone cover, by the way? I'll never mistake it for anybody That's else's true. on the That's table. True. Point. Yeah, Very I'm, not, I'm not going to go to Black Otter Box when the 14 comes out. Okay, good adventure. It's been about a decade, yeah. but um, if it falls in the snow, I can find it. So, so here, here's here's the other like let you pee there me, first. Leave your real problem. Oh. You can solve this live. I need to hire. Sometimes somebody. I need time to. <laughs> I, solve I need to hire somebody, right? Okay. Kitchen staff. Is this um, an interview? No, I need to hire somebody kitchen staff. Maybe, I mean, maybe. Well, you'd be already be hired, but you first got to convince me I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how. <laughs> um, you know, what do we do? We go on Facebook Marketplace and start posting there. Where do we, where else we go? I guess we've tried the trial of Indeed. We've done this, done that. Um, you know, we, we get subpar candidates. And the number one thing that blows my mind, because this is almost like ingrained in me as a child, like when you see an officer, yes or no, sir. When you set an interview, you fucking go. It's not just, it's just applicants. It, it's unbelievable. We get people that actually interview. They agree to come work, and they don't even show up for the first yep. training. It's everywhere. It, it, in every and city is, and in every industry. Like, wh what happened? What happened? These people were 20. What happened 20 years ago to those people? Like, are they just in this, you know, COVID counterculture like we're no. working, working okay. No, is working's okay. It's not. Do it's it? not the age. It's is not it the, the culture. Eager? It is something that's going on right now. And before we go anywhere, I, I say like, have like casting calls. You got to have casting yeah. calls because like, you tell everybody you, you, to arrange an interview today is oh, we fucking ridiculous. We waste time. You should. You're saying like, if ten people show up, oh, yeah. wait ten, twenty. Like you yep. have it. Yeah. You advertise it on a day, a specific day, and they come and they wait you to watch audition. Them interact. Like yeah, yeah. Yep. you make them wait. If they're interested, they'll wait. Damn, I should do this. Like, but like having know. like one person come in to meet you at one specific time, like that's just ridiculous. You're not going to win that way, and you're just going to get more and more pissed. Uh, you won't even be try to get a a carpenter, an electrician, or a plumber to come back to your house. They'll yeah, even no, come for an that. estimate and not show yeah, up. Yeah, they did all the free work for right. free. And did not, you know, yeah, right. I, but I think it's a matter casting of... Casting calls, though. I like there's that. interest. There's always interest by so many people. Even people that you're willing to pay, not just inside the restaurants and bars, but in, in your home, just do, doing handyman work stuff. But the interest isn't bigger than what else they've got going on. Yeah, that's it. That's all in it comes general, down to. Whether it's a, you know, yeah, I want to work there. I'd like Brown to concert or oh, or, or yeah. you know, it's like being twenty. Dog for a while, it's like right? being that's twenty years point. old in college and being like, I wanted to take this psych class and it started at nine thirty and I just woke up at nine forty five and you're like, fuck, I missed it. And like, what am I gonna do now? Like, you know, I, yeah. I'm not gonna come back to you and be like, sorry, I overslept because you're never gonna hire me. You're right. probably already right, pissed. Right. Sure, sure, sure. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, so there's an element of that too, but I think. One of the ways to weed it out is to have multiple casting calls on specific days. Yeah. You want to work? Like, this is the time where I'm getting shit done on my laptop at a table. And if nobody shows up, Watch I'm still getting stuff done. Yep. And if they show up, that's great. One at a time. Let's just burn through them. One, two, three. Yeah. Great point. And, and how are you going about getting some of those people in? What do you, what do you think is good? That's the yeah, thing, right? That's the other thing. Like, fill in the yep. funnel. So, so now we have, like, a way to... It's easy for somebody like me that has a big network to get GMs and executive chefs. Sure, but sure, sure. line cooks, right, line cooks and servers and bartenders got it. The, the only way I've been successful 
is from the people that are already working there. Yeah. Working there, yeah. yeah. Got friends. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if they love you and they're having fun at work, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not saying it's trophy culture shit where you have to have right. parties and, and, and fun games and contests for them every night and all that bullshit. Trust like, falls. just be a good dude. Be a cool woman that cares about their yeah. people and is a good ear but is a parental figure. Make that family happen. And they're going to be like, you know what? I know somebody that also works in the same line of work because yeah. it's a small fraternity. Like, yeah, I mean, is, we, yeah. we met each other. And, I mean, we went to high school together. We never knew each other. But yeah. because of this, we found each other. Right, right, right. You, like, it just gravitates. And guaranteed, they know somebody who is not happy yeah. with where they are or not True. thrilled. And if they're super happy, they're not even saying, hey, do you want to come work with us? Somebody will say, like, are they hiring? Yeah. That's where you want to be. Right, right, right. Makes sense. Makes sense. But that being said, you know, you, you, you got to do the best with what you got. Uh, so I have um, hospitalityhelpline.com, which is like like Dear Abby kind of stuff. People send me. Wait, what? Yeah. Like they send me these questions and then I. How do they send them? Email. Oh, okay. And then I answer them like in a column. So like you so don't do you, interact. Where do you find this? Hospitalityhelpline.com. The so nice. com. There's a thing called the internet, Joe. Yeah. I think I've used that word. The hospitalityhelpline.com. It's on, when people are bitching and complaining. I'm like, let me just call the hospitalityhelpline.com. <laughs> it's on the <laughs> like, World Wide Web. Oh yeah, yeah the interwebs. The interwebs. Oh, interwebs. Nice. It's on the internet. Jeez, so how long have you been doing and, that? Uh, since well. COVID, because okay. I, everybody got an hour for free, and then pretty soon I couldn't keep up. So I was like, here it is. It's all on a website. And then kind of when things died down, I was like. All right, now I'll give you like 20, 30 articles you can see for free, but you have to pay now sure. like nine bucks a month, cool. 10 bucks a month. Uh, but um, there is a more interactive group that I moderate um, called uh, Restaurant and Bar Owners, Operators, and Managers, which is a Facebook group where it's like everybody inputs. Yeah. And we're at like 9,000 people. And I'm not nice. only vigilant, but I have a lot of members um, that will help and report and like, look, this dude is not an owner or a manager. Right, He's right. a sleeper yeah, we're, agent. We're doing the same thing and right now. We, we, and I, we have a local one. I yeah. think we do a better job than most any other site I'm on cool. in weeding people out. But um, one of the things that you know I just came up with today was um, explaining like, hey, yeah, there are ideals and there are plans. And it's like you know the old expression, everybody has a great plan until they get punched in the fucking mm-hmm. face. Well, th- we're, a lot of us are getting punched in the face. So you got to say, okay, that's the ideal. That's the plan. That's plan A, B, and C. But when none of that shit works because there's just nothing there, then you have to change your how. So, and what I mean by that is like, why do you do what you do? I know what you do mm-hmm. and I know what you do, but why do you do it? And when you focus on the why, your how is much more flexible. Mm-hmm. Like sure. there are a lot of people that just need to say, look, I know you don't want to be a fucking QR code place and you don't want to turn into fucking Panera, but when you have three people, one of them's cooking, one of them's running and one of them's bussing and you just need to give out numbers and run it to the table and go quick service for lunch because that's all you got. And you need to close on Sundays because nobody wants to work on Sunday. Like don't be, you know, don't be that new GM who's got a year or two under their belt and they're like, but that's not the way it's supposed to be done. And like they freak out and their their blood pressure boils and half of your job as yeah. an owner or a director is like just calming them down and be like, make, look, nothing is going to be perfect yes. all the time. Like right. you can't be that owner. Make great experiences out of what you got. And, right. And yeah. the reason why those man, you could always spot like a new rookie exec or GM is because they have like expectations that everything is like, you're not following the rules. Like, like right. they're so high strung. And I'm looking at owners that have been in the business 30, 40 fucking years. And they're like that now because it's like, but this is the way we've always done it. Right. But not saying that. I mean, that's yeah, like yeah, so yeah. cliche. It's for them to turn but it's page. like, well, like, what am I supposed to do now? I can't find It's like, well, you got to do what you got to do. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's not going to be the same. You can't do it this way. We're going to do it a different way. We're going to, we're going to develop a curbside delivery thing. And we're going to start running box lunches and we're going to drive ancillary revenue centers so that the asses in the seats are gravy. You're not dependent on covering payroll right. by how many covers we're turning tonight. Right. Like you just, you, and sometimes it means closing, but what it doesn't mean is I have three people. So I'm going to keep the 300 seats 
and just give everybody shitty service and say, please understand, we're right, understaffed right, 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 right now. Right, 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 and, sure. and sorry, guys, like, it's just you out there. Like, I'm going to fuck that, over my guests I'm about, yeah. and I'm going to fucking treat my staff and max them out and stress them out yeah, so, that I, so that I could still seat the same number of people and my check is the same. Yeah. By the no. way, yeah, yeah, exactly. No. And by the way, the trickle down effect you mentioned earlier, or yeah. you said something along those, stress. Absolutely. When, when people see me stressed out, it might have nothing to do with the bar. But my managers are looking, then they're looking, like, okay. what's up with it? Yeah. You know, That's and that enough. trickles down. That's enough. You don't want to add stress yeah. to that. You don't want to stress out your guests yeah. and your staff. Sure. Because you're guessing, you're guessing there too. You're guessing there, there's the, there goes the your. Business. That's all how right. and no why. Right, 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 you know, right, right. That's all that is. I, I noticed like even like, you know, living above my business, I'm in and out of it a lot. And if I, if I have something going on in my, do you have mind, a fireman's pole? You know, it's so or funny. a slide. I literally, that would be so I literally cool. talked a about spiral this slide. Few years ago. We talked about that 15 years ago about doing that. And I'm like, yeah, my fat ass would get drunk and fall down. But anyway, um, walking through the bar like to, I don't know, go to my car or what, whatever it is. If I'm stressed out or I got something going on, it, my customers feel uncomfortable about it. Um, they, did I do something wrong? You know, like I'll get that. Because right, right, right. well, you're on stage. Yes, you're part of the, the production. Time. All, all the, the time. time. And it's like, they're feeling and part of the show. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, is this the sad part of the show? All the time. Is this the stressful part of the show? So here, here's what I've been thinking. I've been thinking literally just if you close Monday, right? Because I'm a numbers guy, like pure through and through. If I close Monday, gave all my people off at all three locations, but had an industry night on Sunday, I'm really curious to know how my sales would be. Would I make up Monday sales on Sunday night? Three, lo three locations bar. You, you've been to one of my places. You know, local bars. Imagine that. Talk about doubling down for doing things for the industry. Imagine you had an industry night. All right. You built, you, you just built for Sunday night, which is a great night for it because you get football for so many you know weeks out of the year and all mm -hmm. that. But your nobody your place works on Monday because I don't like working on Monday. So let me ask your question, answer your question with okay. another question. Mm. Have you asked your staff? Not yet. Well, what are you asking me for? Like yeah. that's who you need to ask. You make them part of that conversation. Yeah, make it part of the decision because whether you break even or lose. If they're part of the conversation, you're going to win, man. Absolutely. Plus, they don't have to work Mondays. <laughs> they might love that. They might say, yeah. you know what? We all fucking have intramural this or fantasy this that's on Wednesday nights. If you're going to close a night, how about Wednesday? It might, you might yeah. find, right. talk to them. My father with the blue laws at the bar, you know, we've been there so long that, you know, we used to have to close on Sundays. And he used to talk about how much he missed that day where everybody had mm -hmm. off, you know what I mean? They cleaned the bar, whatever it was, but there was something to be said about that where everybody has off. The only, the problem with that though, is that if you have full-time staff, you know, it, it's they're scheduling two days in a row off. Yeah. You know what I mean? But in, in a lot of these businesses, not anymore. Yeah, but it's, it's, it goes beyond the quality of life mm -hmm. and, yeah, and numbers. Works. I mean, I'm a numbers guy too. That's the difference Some between work three days week, running a still. place and being in your own kitchen, right? Yeah, right, right it's right, all right. numbers. But that being said, knowing that your staff is doing something other than clocking in and clocking out mm -hmm. for you and finding out what it is and knowing what they're doing Monday through Sunday is pretty powerful, not only on the connection you make with your staff, but on helping you make those decisions. And right. when in literally including hourlies and that kind of conversation or letting your managers do that, I don't know how, what the structure is, but right. if it's, if it's you, it's you, but they will see you differently, I guarantee you. When you talk to them and say, one by one, sit down for five, 10 minutes with each one of them and say, what's your week look like? What's your schedule look like? What's your family doing? Do you have kids? Like, what's going on? Um, I just want to make this fun, easy, and cash for you. I don't yeah. want this to be a headache for you. Right. And, right, right, right. And, and, it's, and be honest, be transparent. Like, here are the numbers. We're not hitting, we should right. be hitting. Like we just need to trim fat and cut hours. Like I wanna to talk to you before I do that. I wanna to talk to everybody here and see where can we do it where it actually helps you and doesn't hurt you. Yeah. Even if there's no way and they're like, you can't close one, like just asking the question. Sure. Makes you in a different class of ownership. Mm. Yeah, you're literally asking them whether you should close your business. What a big question. It, suddenly it's their business too. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, oh, no one's going to care about, well, no shit, they're not going to care about your business as much as you do because they don't make yeah, what right, you do. Right, right. But if you treat them 
like what they are, which is really a partner. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to get a different response, not only that day, but every day after that, in my opinion. That's, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. And, and those are the people that when you leave, they cry. They say goodbye, asshole, on the cake, right. but they cry. And they miss you. And 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, they remember you and they're happy to have a beer with you. Yeah. It's important. And, and when they do leave, it's the same thing. When you, when you treat people with respect and like the assets they are instead of collateral mm -hmm. and they leave, somebody else is going to know that. Yeah, right. Absolutely. No, and that's not if why you do mad, it. But if they leave mad, you the story's going to be even worse. <laughs> right? You, right. Well, you can't control. Assholes we'll are going to be different. assholes. We'll tell different. You, you know, you can't we'll prevent every asshole, fire. Right, as they drink. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, I hear you. So, okay. Back to this hospitality helpline. Okay. <laughs> like, it exists. It's a thing. Can I help you? Help so you, help if, you? if I call right now, your oh, phone's going to ring. <laughs> no, it's not a, it's, it's yeah, not it's, a it's, phone. Oh, okay, right, right. It's an okay, email. So, it's so email, you right. email in a question, and I get maybe 10, 11 awesome. per week. And very often there's overlap. Like somebody's asking a question, and, and uh, it's almost identical to like two or three other questions. Sure. So that's the one all? I'll answer. No, I don't okay, answer okay. them all. Hello, um, my name Peggy. Welcome to the hospitality. <laughs> well, and sometimes like somebody will say, like, don't use my name. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. they're sure, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right well not just you know they don't want to but they don't they're they're telling me about a bad problem that yeah. you know sure, sure, sure. you know there's confidentiality when it needs to be but um <laughs> no it's, it's awesome. not an open forum there's not That's a lot of back cool. and forth hospitalityhelpline.com tell us about your app yeah the app i have an app too it's a baby it's it was awesome. uh just launched in october like october 20th okay and uh it is a lot of people try to call it the anti Yelp. I try not to focus on the negative. It's uh, an app where it helps you find more restaurants that you're going to love. Um, and it does that through artificial intelligence. You rate restaurants, but you're not rating them publicly. So it's not like a platform to bash anybody and you can't like buy fake reviews on Fiverr or anything. Mm. It's, it's, you answer honestly. You're not rating to warn or to tell other people anything. You are rating restaurants to train this algorithm to know what you like, what you don't like, what you might be willing to try so that it can continually calculate your compatibility. And it gets smarter. The more you use it, it gets smarter. It's like your best friend. Uh, it's like the great gazoo for restaurants. Nice. And you ask it stuff, and you'll see it's based on emojis. Wherever you are, uh, it'll calculate. It's, it's like a dating app. For your mouth so you take these like fun taste test quizzes and you know what do you like on a hot dog what what kind of pizza is mm -hmm. real pizza to you you know right. um that's cool and and so a lot of what's out there right now is an open platform where you publicly rate things and they give you like a one size fits all score sure uh you know for like this is popular or or there's a lot of like every city has like the best of list sure but you know, if you're not that popular and or if you're you not on play, right. Or if you're not on main and main, or if you don't have a, you know, $10 million restaurant and a $200,000 a year marketing budget right? and you're a small place that nobody knows about, you're not on those best of lists. Right. You don't have a, a, any Michelin stars. Yeah. Um, and so we help you find those places if there, if it's compatible with your own personal taste, because at the end of the day, look, we all want people to come in, right? You want yeah, as sure. many asses at the bar and in seats as you can. But what you don't want is you don't want to be dragging people off the street. Come in, come in. And then they don't like it. And then they just, that was terrible. Waste of time, waste of money. Yeah, right. Especially. They rate you bad. Right. Nobody, you know, like hospitality is not get into my house. I want to serve you. <laughs> it's like, hey, like, can I make you comfortable? Can I make you happy? What would sure. you like? Like, do you like it? If you don't. Please like go. I don't want you here being miserable. Right, right. The purpose is not to get more asses in seats. It's getting the right asses mm, in yeah. your seats because there's no fucking such thing as best. Best is so subjective. Absolutely. You know, I, we were talking earlier at the bar, like when you're in this industry, as long as people like us are, and you're talking to somebody who isn't, who has either known that or just finds out what's the number one thing they ask you. 
I'm going. I'm going to be in New York this week. Where, where should, should I go? go? Where should oh, I go? oh, you're you have a couple places. Del- where? Tell me another great place in Delco or on the main line. I need to know. That's like so. When I hear that, I hear you're an ice cream guy. Yeah. I'm going out for ice cream. Like, what flavor should I get? Right. Yeah, like, right. I, I don't. So what happens? A 20 minute conversation. Like, well, what flavors have you right, had right, that you right, don't right, like? Right. What flavors yeah, have you yeah, had yeah, that you that's do? That's the like? survey in the beginning. Well, it's it's constant. It's right. It's constant. Initially, like, yeah, yeah. It's always doing that. Every time you rate something or answer a quiz question, it's getting it's it's me only on because I'm not if it's your anniversary and you're looking for a special place in Philly, I'm not telling you my ten favorite restaurants in Philly because you might not like them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Taste is personal. That's like one of the whole things. Like sure. I like what I like, you like what you like. So I want to get to know you, where you've been, what kind of service you like, what kind of atmosphere you like. Mm-hmm. How far away from your hotel do you want to go? Do you want to walk? Are you willing to go for a 30 minute drive? Um, where have you been in Philly that you hated? Where have you been that you loved? And 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 I get like ridiculous bottles of tequila or, or scotch or wine. Like, thank you. This is for you. Like we had such an amazing time. We went to Cape May and we went to Black Duck and we stayed at the Virginia. Like blew our minds. Like it was exactly what we wanted and i'm yeah. not going to recommend that for everyone because mm-hmm. some yeah, people sure. are like feel like they're in their grandmother's house or eating foo-foo fancy food and yeah you know it's they want they want it's, it's like a restaurant you don't or a bar <clears throat> you don't serve the the alcohol and the food that just you like because it's going to be you me your mother and a couple friends right. you serve what the neighborhood needs right, and wants right, right, and, right. and that's the kind of mentality instead of you know making it about ratings or paying or playing and bashing like there's always going to be a platform for people yeah, who sure, want sure, to be sure. heard or feel like yeah, they're being heard. Or want one, one yeah. higher Google ranking. Absolutely. Right. And, and to people that want to go to the most popular places. But there's 9 million channels where you can find what's the most popular. So, We're there for everybody else. So walk me through the experience, right? I downloaded this app. Is it, is it generally available in app stores yet? App store, Google Play, or the web. Okay, yeah. so it's generally available, right? Yeah. From when I download it. Open it up. Probably do like the my name is, my email address is, verify whatever. From that point, what's my experience from there to when I'm actually like browsing? So or... it, right away, it takes you to these taste personality quizzes. Okay, and how 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 fast are they? You can take one, or you could take okay, three hundred cool. of them. Cool. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. I think and I would stop all or go back like twenty minutes. <laughs> They're kind right. of you get kind of addicted to it. Mm-hmm. It's like right, right, okay. it's fun, and we're gonna gamify well, like it later on. Like you're yeah. gonna get points and and stuff like that. Sure, but. Sure. Um, yeah, you, you answer these questions, so it gets to know you a little bit better. And then that's the base knowledge. And then you start rating restaurants that you've been to already. Places you like, places you didn't like, okay. places you hated, places you love, whatever. And, and then so essentially, one of the big things that it's doing, it's crowdsourcing people that don't know each other and aren't publicly interacting online. So let's say that you're from Austin and I'm from Philly, and I rate like 100 places in Philly in my neighborhood, Mm -hmm. and you rate 100 places in your neighborhood. And then, coincidentally, you're answering your questions almost identically to mine. We have like a 98% compatibility on the quizzes. And you come to Philly, right, and you go to a couple places in my neighborhood, and you rate them or some of the meals, um, and then I go to Austin, well, guess what's gonna happen? Even though we've never met and I don't know you, if we have a very high compatibility rate, the places in your neighborhood that you rate really highly gonna are going to come up, up as again. I'm going to be compatible with those places, gotcha. even if they're not super popular or super famous or considered to be the best of or get the good write ups right. um, by a local critic or anything. And I think that movies from like Chef to Burnt mm-hmm. to you know Bourdain's book to Food Network has created, or I should say narrowed the delta between like Joe Schmo and some foodie expert. Like three out of four Americans consider themselves foodies. Yeah. So it's crazy. you're getting people that don't need a food critic anymore because they're realizing that, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but really taste is personal and the best is so subjective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, one of the interesting things we found that although Food Network has done that, um, they've also really popularized the contests of uh, these Top Chef contests, which are great. And I know some people that are on the shows and doing really well. But 
it gets to be at a point kind of like culinary masturbation. Like it's like quick, how fast can you get yeah. this done and pretty make it look and go, 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 go. I hate watching. And, and well, right. And then you see stuff that is complex and very artisan and beautiful and mm -hmm. like gourmet, high end artisanal cuisine. And you have people saying, congratulations, you're the, they're literally programming people to not only know what great food is, but what it means to be a great chef or a top chef. So when we started, we spent a year doing research and talking to people, everybody. Like mm. I was the obnoxious guy who was like, how often do you go out to eat a week? Like, how do you decide right. what do? Is it Yelp or TripAdvisor? Like, how do you decide? Yeah. And what was amazing was there were so many people, hundreds, that would say, oh, we, I, like, we don't go out, we don't dine out. I'm like, you mm. don't go out to dine? And they're like, no. And so like in my head, I'm thinking, I've, I've been working in restaurants for over 30 years. You're like, that doesn't jive with anything I know. Right. So I'm like, so you're telling me that you cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner, every meal, seven days a week, you don't go out at all? And like, well, we go out, but you know, it's like we go to like, uh, like Cracker Barrel or we go to local diner or we go to Ruby too. I'm like, yeah, those are restaurants. That's, yeah, sure. that's yeah, dining. That was my question. That's real. <laughs> those are real places. But people in this culture of foodies, like the people that like almost alternative food, yeah. they're diminished. Yes. Like they're, they're made to feel a little less than, and they've been excluded. Like they're like not welcome at the table because that's not what we're serving tonight. And so it's like, like, this app isn't just for foodies and adventurous people who go out and will have a bad meal and say, wow, well, that was, that was terrible. Like, I can't believe like they did that with that. And I start breaking it down. It's more educational sure. and interesting to me. Like, why would they do that? Or right. it was terrible. But, uh, I'm blessed to be in that situation and, and not just because I can afford to spend 20 bucks and it not break me, but because I'm just so into the components of what's happening on my dish and in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people that don't go out multiple times a week like I do, and they go out once a month. And, and guess what? Labor, oil, fuel, rent, mounting debt. Yeah. Like this is a whole nother question, you know, issue yeah, sure. that I have, like corporate restaurants and big chains <clears throat> are, are keeping independent operators feeling guilty about raising prices because they don't want to look like they're gouging people, but yeah, either a pencils or it doesn't like your numbers guy. Yeah. You need to charge more. If it's yeah, costing it more, to, yeah. you have to pass it on. It's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. So stop bleeding, tie off the wound, do what needs to be done. But as these costs increase and people are busy, that rolling the dice to go to a place, it's like dating. Like eventually, like if you're not successful at finding somebody new, what happens? You're like, fuck it. I'm just going out with my boys. And, and the same thing happens in restaurants. Like I tried, it was supposed to be this amazing place. It's nonsense. It was a waste of money, time. I can't afford to do that again. Like same thing. And it's okay. emotional too. You like, you go with what you know. And the restaurant industry can't afford you to stop dating. Like I know it's a band aid, but the best way to get through this is more volume. And the yeah. only way you get more volume is if people are incentivized or encouraged to try more restaurants. So this is my way of trying to help do that. This is my way of trying awesome. to help people say, we're gonna mitigate the risk here. We're gonna try to do our best to make sure that the next place you try is someplace you're gonna love. And for the restaurant owners, we got people S's and seats that already are predisposed to love our place before they get there. Right, and especially if you're not marketing, I mean, you know, uh, you talk about Yelp earlier, we were talking and uh, I was managing um, this place for a guy as, as his director of ops and we were having a lot of problems. We actually had a couple that was started dating in the restaurant. We let it happen. And uh, they were grossly inappropriate work, like off the charts, like you're gone, you're done. And they turned it into something it wasn't and said, you know, in no unclear terms, you guys are fucking assholes and this, you're anti-gay and we're gonna make sure everybody knows it. And there was so much shit on Google and TripAdvisor and Yelp. And I went to Javits at the, you know, the restaurant expo mm -hmm. and I met with a couple reps, more than one for more than one of these companies. And it was, I mean, if you've ever seen Million Dollar Bully, it's, it's a real documentary. They literally said, 
well, you know, we'll look, we could look into it, but if you're a customer and you buy like one of these advertising or SEO packages, if you're a customer, what we can do is a, a value this other suite of services where we'll make sure that they're verifiable. And if they're not, we can push them to the bottom right. and make the ones that are easy, more easily verified up to the top. So in other words, we'll put the good reviews as the first few pages people see and the bad reviews at the bottom right. or not even include them in your your score calculation, your rating, overall rating, right, right, your right. cumulative score. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Because yeah. they could have spent $200 on Fiverr and bought a thousand, I mean, you could buy yeah, positive sure. reviews, but yeah. you could buy negative reviews too for your competition. Yeah. So I'm like, this is, this is a fucking racket. I beat him in Delco's, most Delco bar competition. I, you almost said best. I saw that coming out. Yeah, well, I would have smoked that. Again, not a I, best. You would have to buy you either, you either go he would in, have to buy votes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, so it's it avoids all that. Like, there's no need to game. That dude system. still hits me up, by the way. Yeah. What dude? Ikram. Ikram. The vote guy. My vote guy. In, oh, oh, in, in, yeah. in, in, in uh, Dubai. Yeah. Um, like, like I want to do more business. So let me <laughs> let me ask you a question. Um, I'm very curious to know how do you manage your expectations with regards to what in a and a new business that, that you just want to get out there. I mean, because one of the, one of the biggest things that I have like managing in my head with this podcast is like, I just want people to listen to it and blah, blah, blah. How do you manage your expectations? Like, all right, we're, we're new. All right. And where we should be, do, do you set reasonable goals for yourself? What do you do? I think I do. Okay. Um, so for example, we had, uh, I, I know I just totally turned this train around, but I'm, no, I'm well, curious. I looked at my social networks of people I know and people I'm connected with. And I said, okay, it's like, I have 75,000 people that look at hospitalityhelpline.com in a, every year. And I have my restaurant bar owners and managers. That's like 9,500 people. Um, I've got like 2000 connections on LinkedIn. You know, you start doing the math and you come up to like 20,000 people. And so you're like, okay, then 200 should be a reachable number, right? 200 people mm -hmm. that download this app out of 20,000 people that I could reach. Now I know I'm not a marketing expert. I don't know how to reach them. And we're bringing somebody on at the end of the month, but um, to help with that, but essentially you gotta say like, just make the nut so small that if that's not worth it, then go back to your why. Why are you doing it? Right. Are you doing this to help yourself learn and help me learn? Because that's what dialogue does at sure. its core value. Like Absolutely. talking to you guys, I'm remembering things and I'm thinking about right. things and I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm considering things and I'm Twice seeing things differently. Yep. So, right. So if that's why you're doing it, then you're winning. You just yeah, won. Yeah. Yeah, right there on. you go. Right There's yeah, your, if that's your expectation, but I mean, you just met it. But when you're talking about an app, this is something you're taking money and time into, right? Yeah. Um, and fundamentally it's gotta, it has to make money for you, right? Like this, this could be a hobby that could turn into something for us, but okay, you, on the other hand. So ahead. I'm gonna sound like a fucking hippie right now or something, but my goal for this was to see something that is broken or could be better and dedicate myself to making it better. Not for the money, for the people, for the guests and for restaurants because that's what I'm passionate about. I am passionate about making people happy and making them happier and making restaurants and building offline community because that's the world I love. Okay. It's, it's not me trying to give back to an industry that's given me so much. I'm trying to give back to an industry that's given me everything. Like I met my wife in one of our restaurants. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter who's 12 years old because of this industry. You know what I think of when he awesome. says that? I'm thinking uh, we, we just had Earl Strickland in here who plays, he's one of the best pool players in the world. And Joe, you know, had him in at his place. Um, Marty's and you know did private tutoring and all that jazz we had him on the podcast he is the opposite of where you're at right now he's so fed up and furious at pool because it's never been marketed correctly and it's never made real money because literally one of the best pool players in the world the only way they make money outside of gambling are tournaments mm -hmm. where the purse is thirty thousand dollars yeah you know what I mean and it's all because there's no TV uh, money that's coming in for pool. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at you and 
You're saying you're doing this for... Well, no, I, I didn't finish. Okay. That's what I see, and that's the challenge I set for myself. But my why is bigger than that. Okay. As a father, I don't care if I win. I don't care if I make my money back. I probably won't. If you told me how much this was all going to cost five years ago, I'd be like, you're out of your fucking... Where am I going to get that kind of money? Right. But like a couple thousand here, a couple thousand, like mm -hmm. pretty soon you're like, oh my God, yeah. are, you, are you kidding? My now. accountant's like, really? Like, yeah, oh yeah, that, that's capital expenses. Where do you see your tax returns when you offer this for sale? You're going to yeah. start seeing something come back. But the purpose now is to have an indelible record online that she can look at if, if a bus takes me tomorrow out, right? That she sees, has an example of sticking with something, of okay. trying to make something, of building a team, of finding people that I knew nothing about technology. I, st I still know just enough to basically have a conversation with you about it. Sure. But like finding people and motivating them and making them see a vision and working together. I've my partners are my friends now, and they're people who come from very different religious, socioeconomic geographic backgrounds that there's no chance in hell that if it wasn't for this project, we wouldn't be friends. And it's, you know, not to say, again, not sound like a hippie, but I believe we're a collection of everyone we touch in our lives, sure, whether it's yeah, like sure. a wave on the street or a, a 10 year relationship or and so when somebody dies, they're not here, but a part of them is in you. Like we're just a collection of people. Right. And these guys have become a part of me. And, and this 12 year old little girl, might not be paying strict attention, but she's soaking it in. And it's forming her reality of what kind of person to be. And I just want her so badly not to be a person that's like, well, this is the way it's always been done. I want mm. her to be like, maybe I could change that. Maybe it's not a restaurant app or, you know, open in a bar. Yeah, whatever it is. Maybe it's something else. But I want her to understand that if she applies herself, it might not happen overnight. And it might not happen at all, but it's worth trying because it's the journey. It's about growing, learning, and building something, whether it's a bar, an app, a nursery, mm -hmm. a hospital, whatever she wants to do, yeah. a, vet, a, you know, a horse clinic. I don't know. Whatever she's into. I want her to know that, that she can try and build something, especially when I see so many people not building anything, just yeah. existing day trading or taking something and repackaging it and buying it at Walmart and selling it on, you know, uh, Amazon. Which is fine if you have great hobbies that's in life. That's cool. But, yeah, yeah. If that's what you're into, but, but I get off on building stuff yeah. and making things yeah. better. And I just, I want her to be like me, I guess yeah. there's a bit of egocentrism to it all. Sure. Sure. But, um, I just want to be a good example for her. Her mom is like a ridiculous example. Like she literally saves babies. Yeah. And, Doctor, and children. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. From like zero to 18. She's literally saving lives. So like this kid is growing up realizing like I could do it, It's not how important or how many people respect you or like you or know you. It's about just being content with your project or what you're doing. Roger that. So I've, I've got my 200 people. Now I want to get 2000 by the uh, middle of the summer yeah. and then 20,000 by next summer. So I do have other goals okay. and, and, you know, benchmarks, but the big part was getting it launched and setting an example. So I've won, I've got, I've accomplished something that I don't think any amount of money could buy. Um, now if I could help more people and make money, then that's all gravy. That's awesome. Yeah. So where are you, where would you say you are? So you mentioned that you, you got the thing launched, mm -hmm. right? You have a user base currently. Yeah. Right. Small, small. Yeah. So we really, we need to onboard. Yeah. It's because about the more people users, on right? it, right. And the more you use it and the more people on it, the better it's going to work. I'm excited to manage a Facebook marketing campaign for you, but we'll talk about that later. Absolutely. Um, like starting next week. Um, but so I, I guess from now till say like a million users, right. Hypothetically, what are some of the like hardest challenges you think you face outside of, you know, having our servers hosted and everything and right, according right, right. to like Amazon or something like that is iteration. So we, um, have some focus groups where, uh, we'll get together and, you know, I basically bribe people with food and drink and sure. apply them with alcohol so that then I don't feel guilty 
uh, <laughs> asking, you know, what do you think about this? Which, if these are the next features, which ones do you think you want to see first? Because, right. I mean, it's done for now, but we've sure. already got 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and Enterprise already being architected. So the next thing that we're working on that should be out soon is um, shareable lists. So there's also a list making where you can make bucket lists or list of places to try or your favorite list or date night places, places right. for, that are cool for my dog, my right, favorite right, right. rooftop places in Chicago, whatever. Sure, sure. And um, right now the only way to share those with somebody else is to screenshot it and send it as a photo. Um, but what we wanna do is make them publicly discoverable uh -huh. and be able to like literally share it with you so that you can download it and you'll have my favorite places in London in your phone so that when you're there you can say, Oh, hey, I tried your, your first three places and they suck, man. Like, I'm the, like, I don't want your recommendations. Or conversely, like, oh, my God, like, I'm so glad I had it. Plus, it gives people a way to be influencers on, on the platform as well. Yeah. It, um, so the opportunity to bring a social component into it is pretty exciting. And part of that is, like, you'll be able to notify, set notifications if you're within one, three, or five miles of one of the places on your list, it'll notify That's you. Cool. Um, uh, you can message people. You'll find out if there's somebody else who has social discovery turned on in the bar that you don't know, and you'll be able to see their profile. If they have it turned on and you have it turned on, you could see your compatibility with that mm. person. And you'll be able to see their profile and their, like whatever lists they mark as discoverable and not private, you'll be able to see. And you could go over and say, oh, I see you're from... You know, I don't know, um, Denver, right? And uh, and I see some of the places on your on your bucket list that you have. Like I've been to all of them. Like I I could tell you something about them, or let me buy you a drink. I mean, it could turn yeah, into sure, a sure. dating more, kind more, of app yeah, social for dating. food yeah. people and bar people. But cool. you know, however people decide to use it is cool. But right. uh, we we don't want people to be able to contact people when they're not in proximity. Sure, sure, sure. So we want to build offline community. You mean you're trying to the restaurants and bars, get not. rid of dick pics on there. Is that what you're saying? I'm sure we could summon up a dick pic or okay. two for you. All right. Okay. okay. <laughs> Premium. Yeah, you can yeah. Just listen to yeah, the pro. hot dog. Hot dog That's a uh, course jobs. pro. That's 19.99 a month. Sorry. I always kind of make shit. So, um, yeah. So course, so that's how you download it right now, of course. So well, so it, it's course restaurant guide because there's a gotcha, million right, cor like course, Coursera yeah, sure. and yeah, like sure, sure, biology sure. course and right. there's some golf course stuff. So if you search for it as course restaurant guide, you'll find it. But if you have a coupon code, um, the only way to redeem that is on the web version. So you gotcha. have to create your account there and then you could download Google or Apple app and access it with your credentials, your username and login. It's like Netflix. Yeah, kind sure, of. So, sure, sure. That's good. Um, no, I was going to, that uh, open auth was the first question I was going to ask you about. Okay. Which you may not know what that is, but it's exactly what you just said. Yes. Yeah. So if uh, any of your listeners do, be, we'll set up a code behind bars 22. All oh, nice. one word. What do, what do they get? They'll get an extra three months. So everybody gets three months for free uh, to try free. out the app when they awesome. download it. So um, we'll give behind bars listeners six months. Nice. Oh, Dig it. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank so you. That should be enough time to make some yeah, less absolutely. and check it out. Yeah, and yeah, hopefully um, we'll get you guys uh, some more, you know, some more people using the app so you can figure out what That works. would be awesome, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, points, points. Points. Yeah, so yeah. like, here's an example. Like, I use Open Table. Why? Because I'm in the middle of a meeting or a podcast and I want to go to dinner in two hours, right? Okay. Just easy, right? Just see, I don't have to talk to people, just book mm -hmm. it. Um, assuming the restaurant, you know, uses it. And if they do, then I use it. If they don't, I call. Resi, caviar, whatever exactly, they use, that's right. fine. So... But, but the points are stupid. Like the points, you don't get anything for them. So like if you do a point system, it has to mean something. That's the only thing I want to say. So, uh, cause, cause like, okay, so what? I can book a table 15 minutes earlier than somebody else? Like, right. fuck you, I'll call them and they'll give me the same table. If, I'm pretty sure they will. Well, there's so. a tremendous amount of people, I think, that like points just for points. There's a Candy like a Crush score. atmosphere where yeah. it's like, you know, uh, you know, I have a 12 year old daughter and a wife that's around my age. And, you know, same thing. Like, what level? I don't know, 118. Like, oh, look. And it's a reference point, yeah. and it's it's neat, and it's cool, <clears throat> and it's fun, and it makes you want to play. And it, but there's another set of people that say, so what do you get for that? 
Right. Well, there's a reason why us, Waze has you know that shit on there. Yeah, like, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what about what about uh, the palm with the character on the wall? If you get to so many points, palm the palm points, whatever the club is, they something four numbers. I forget what it is. I have the card in my pocket right now. Sorry, palm. But um, you get a character on the wall, and yeah. we used to like always do our corporate dinners and stuff down at the Palm in Atlantic City, and it's all I want. So <laughs> it's funny you say that because but that cost that we, cost them fifty bucks or hundred bucks. To put it yeah. in the digital world, and with course, uh, a lot of things that are out there right now are uh, NFTs, yeah, sure. and and uh, crypto. Yep. So we would like to go in a perfect world. Fast forward three years from now, right now in two point the points. Every time you rate a restaurant or create another list or mark something off, um, you get a certain number of points. Even when you fill out your profile right, right, and update right, that, right. you get points. Um, when you get a certain number of points, you earn a free month. So you'll be able to oh, cool. never okay. pay for the app. Because you're if, if, helping if, if, us yeah, yeah, absolutely. populate yeah. it and yeah. have people. You're helping other people. You're helping us. So why would you pay for it? So we want to give people the opportunity to you know rate 10 restaurants in sure. a month and you just earn yourself another free month. Bring yeah. 10 friends so, get a free happy uh, free right. happy hour. But yeah. what it has we're, to be meaningful. We're That's also awesome. going to put it into um, a wallet first before a coin so we're going to have a wallet that you can put almost like an Apple wallet. Yeah. And the points you can choose which restaurants that end up with enterprise accounts to buy gift cards. So if I see that one of your favorite restaurants were connected on there and I see that it's, you know, PJ Dolan's, I could send you a $20 gift card credit on a QR cool. code and whatever POS they have, they can scan it. Yeah. Or if it's just a barcode or just, they could see that it's redeemed and delete it. Yeah. However advanced or unadvanced yeah, they are. No, I, dig that. Um, I think your point should be coins. And well, it should be like, like course coin is definitely in the works. Right. Yeah. Now you're getting me interested. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, it could actually like, literally be tied to something. It's it not just it. Right. It could go so up. I can do a bunch of stuff also, and I have like, a, you know, they, they talk like about getting a sack of coins. Like, you, like with that, what, that's like minor or like, you know, people that do crypto, like yeah. when they get this new coin, there's, there's groups that just have like these new coins that are like point zero 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 zero. So, so what throw a hundred dollars into it. Yeah, and, and then it might be five years before it pops, but or it might be nothing, or it might be nothing. Right. But either way, you're. But getting this a, is tangibly yeah. tied to something where you could redeem a coin yeah. or a certain number of coins for a free annual year membership, or mm. once Enterprise comes up, it should be built in wallet. Too. <laughs> when enter, when Enterprise comes up, you can use it to pay for an Enterprise, or to say if you have an Enterprise account, and you want to let people use their coins to buy gift cards at a discount. Yeah, you know, you know. Uh, $75 for a hundred dollar gift card or something like that. Yeah, sure. And then yeah, what we want to do is be able to send lists right. and in money and coins. And that was my cards. first requirement requirement. That was my first requirement for what the, the points. Oh, what, what is the requirement? You, re, you realize well, well, just, 20 just years the, from now, the, the point, the meaningfulness of oh. the point system within the app. Okay. 20 years from now, they're going to be looking back on this podcast when we are all on yachts from course going. You know what I mean? Like, look at that. There's three guys yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying so. You know, the, it's it's important, and I think you you got it. You got it. You got it. Because like, it's just want... it's a slow crawl. We don't have no. I know. You know I know. I eight it, million I dollars in a room full of twenty five engineers. It's been a long, slow crawl up the hill. But yeah, we self funded, and uh, and that's an amazing account. I mean, we're still now we're at the point where we're looking for investment. Yeah, it's great. Have Have you thought about? I'm, I'm sure you had to weigh this out whether or not being on the East Coast is the right place to launch this because of the tech being on the left. You know? Tech is on the left, but you'd be uh, amazed at how much tech yeah. is not only in New York, yeah. but in the Midwest. In Miami yeah. too, right? You know, uh, the uh, Silicon Prairie is, is a real yeah. thing. Yeah, really? And, and New York, don't, don't you know, look Austin. at Steve. I don't know if you follow tech at all, but um, one of the guys who had a really interesting concept and, and just kept pivoting to meet the industry's needs is a guy named Steve Simone who started a company called Bbot, which originally was they run a track and you order from your table and, yeah, and the thing that. picks up at service on a tray and the tray goes up, goes along the ceiling on a track over your table, comes down, you take your drinks off the tray. Really neat. This is reminding me of Conveyor Belt Sushi here, Josh. And yeah, well they did it. Their first uh, test runs were in karaoke bars. Okay. All right, so he, met him at Javits and he started doing orderless 
paying, basically focusing more on that, which hello, COVID perfect timing. Yeah. Then he got a couple of big contracts in New York. So he moved to New York, not only because he wanted to service those accounts, but saw the opportunity where there's a shit ton of tech in the Valley and San Francisco, like all on the left coast and not as much here. And he was part of that movement. Yeah. And so he had a lot of exclusive deals. He just got bought or acquired, however you want to say it, by DoorDash. Hmm. So huge deal. Yeah. And that happened in New York. So um, I think the right place for me to do it is where I'm from and where I live. Sure. And yeah. I'm East Coast. I'm Pennsylvania. Yeah. Like I'm Philly, Philly suburbs guy all my life. I lived, spent a few years always going out, but I always came back home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I agree. It's not where you are. It's where, or it's not where you don't have to go where they are. I mean, with Zoom and no. everything else. Like, well, you know, everybody, it's like you're going to fly and go see him for a week. Right. Like, you know, and if you have kids, you get it. Programmers all over the place. You know, there's, we have a, a 12 year old little girl and there are parents that are sending kids from like third grade, second grade to these Ivy League grooming schools for an Ivy League education. It's like, I don't know. I, I think she's pretty bright, but I think anyone learns as a student, wherever they're most comfortable and they're happiest, that's where they're going to learn the most. It's not where you are as much as the environment. It's not the name of the place. I mean, the same thing, we could circle that back to restaurants too. You know, you can have somebody who is a horrible performer because like I said, I've, like, I think we've all been, we've all had a shit show experience, at least one, and we've all worked for at least one horrible asshole where if they were riding you and just on you, you didn't perform your best. No way. So if you're, you know, whether you're a kid going to school or you're somebody starting a tech company or you're an employee or a manager or an owner, if you're happy where you are, that's where you're going to do best. And this is where I'm happiest. Awesome. So I guess you, you, what, um, what do you, is that consuming all your time right now? Or you still have time for consulting? I do. It used to be like 80% of my time okay. consulting and like 20% on technology. Now right. it's kind of flipped. Flipped. And uh, most of the work I'm doing now consulting, I'm, you know, I've just kind of had to cut the people off that are, you know, hey, we got five guys, we got money, we're ready to open a place, we sure. need you. Sure, sure, like, sure. It's like, Take I over your life can't project. teach you, yeah. Yeah, right. you know, 30 they years of like, yeah, no, because yeah, because I've done that. And, and I end up being, oh, just be the GM, yeah, we'll yeah. Be, we'll call you the director of operation just until things. Yeah, and right. it's like, I have to go. I yeah, can't right, stay. Right, right. And uh, so now I'm more, I'm, I'm working um, for people who have almost as much experience as I do or the same amount or more. And it's like, I'm not there to teach them how this works. I'm there to like Crease be an extra set of hands yeah. and an extra pair of eyes to like help them roll something out that they just don't have time to do yeah. help them, you know, bring on new staff and orient them and train them, you know, look at their processes and evaluate how they can, you know, it's a lot of process improvement stuff. Exactly. Grease and wheels yeah. and saying like, sometimes it's cliche, but sometimes you really are too close to the trees to see the forest, you know, and it's like, it's your baby. So you can't say like, you know, your kid has a lisp and like, no, she doesn't. Yeah. yeah right, right. I did. Um, uh, seminar at the bar and nightclub convention um, a couple years back. Joe and I went out with, uh, for five days or whatever, and, and the t the topic of it was uh, big box systems and mom and pop pubs. You know, because I mean? so many bar owners don't do any systems at all. It's just like, all right, you know, let's hope people come in that type of thing. And uh, I don't know, I, I so many people just overlook so many really important things. And well, and those are the hardest ones. Yeah, because they want, you know, there's two management styles at the end of the day. It's kind of like toilet paper over under really. It's, I mean, there's, yeah, you can hold the roll up and, but you either have that management style where you're just going to go in and crack skulls and be like, look guys, we're bringing order to this fucking chaos. The inmates aren't running the asylum anymore. Mm -hmm. My name is Josh and this is how we're going to run it, which I don't believe works. No, it um, or it's like kind of the like, let's walk down the hill mm -hmm. and screw them all things at a time. Yeah. See how it goes. So yeah. integrating yourself into the organization in my experience is the best way to do that. And that takes time and money that a lot of people don't want to spend. Mm -hmm. They'd rather say like, well, you have all just integrate them. It's like, you're telling people who have worked for you for a decade that what they're doing is got to be completely changed. Like yeah. they're going to leave. 
Yeah, right. Or they're going to hate me and then take it out on you. Like, trust me, yeah. I don't want to do this job. Like, this <laughs> or might the, make me... Or you're me... the master at making it their idea. You know what I mean? Right. At the end of the day, it's not doing my reputation any good. And we talked about this earlier. Like, like how many people do you... Re like, I don't reach out to anybody in this. It's a high ego business. Unless we've worked together before or you know someone that I worked with or, or you're like part of one of my online groups. Yeah, right. Like, I'm not knocking on your door. Mm -hmm. And then like, what would you say? Like, who the hell are you? Yeah, you're yeah, going to tell yeah. me that, right. you know, uh, that we're grossing, you know, 8 million a year. What are you going to help me gross 8 million and $50 <laughs> a year? Yeah, like, right. that's okay. It's all right. Thank you, buddy. That's funny. And that's a uh, ubiquity advisors group, right? Yeah. That's it's, your, uh, it's ubiquityadvisors.com. Dot com. Okay. And the name cool. of the, it's a uh, ubiquity group. Awesome. Well, listen, man, we're really stoked for course. Um, you I'm know, stoked that you're stoked. Yeah. He's already, he's already used it. Um, I'll probably be looking for a, a job. Um, but yeah, no, we're, we're really excited to, um, happy to have to, you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. If you were, no, I'm excited. I told you, I'm going to, I'm going to come and, um, we're going to beat some stuff up, kick the tires a little bit and just see what, uh, I knew this meet see, would be see what I can do as far as um you know my cyber background and stuff like that and just see what we might that would be so nice just um, to see like, yeah where absolutely. some just get a perspective just a little like around. hey you know yeah, yeah, call yeah. somebody about that Kick yeah tires exactly a bit. or maybe identify priorities from my perspective related to cyber and, and other no, stuff we're but. spending time and money on <laughs> and that's why it's taken five years to no launch I get it. it I get it I totally get and it and the biggest fear you know two biggest fears you know especially when you know from the consulting end and an ownership end to building technology is like, you just don't want to be the guy like watering the lawn while the roof is on fire. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you hire somebody and yeah. to do something and who's an expert. And then you, and then you find out that the road is like, why didn't you, but Hey uh, yeah. man, you hired, I'm the fireman, <laughs> but you wanted me to put out the fire on the grill. Right. Right. I'm like, right, right. but the roof is on fire. Yeah, right, like, right. <laughs> nah, that's awesome, man. And, and listen, we'll, we'll definitely, um, we're excited to have you back on the show and, and, uh, get updates as we go here. Yeah, so. I can't. I'd like to come back when I have two thousand members. There you go. All right, I'll see well, you. Yeah. Hopefully, at the end of the summer. Then, oh awesome. man, thanks, Josh. All right, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>